Hello, my name is John Merton. I'm a member of the Irish Beekeeping Association. I'm a beekeeper and I live in Dunman, my country, Cork. I'm also a member of Dunman District Beekeeping Association. I've been keeping bees for a number of years now. This morning, in conjunction with Cork County Library and Grow It Forward, I'm going to give you a small talk on pollinators. Now, on the screen, we have Pollinators by John Martin. As I said, I am a beekeeper, and this is myself out working one of my hives with a frame of bees out, and I'm looking for the queen. Now we have a queen found. We've normally marked the queen. I don't go to the trouble to put a, a tag with a number on it. I normally just mark with a green marker, a red marker, a blue marker, white marker, and a yellow marker. Each one represents a different year, each color. This is a baby bee just been born. He's eaten his way out of the cell. As you can see, the cells in the background have been eaten out and the bee has come out already. Some of the cells, the bees have just started to start eating through the capping of the cell to emerge. This is one of the reasons why I could be beekeeping. This is a frame of honey. And we, I just cut a section out of the frame so that you can see the mid-rib and the cells, and how the bees fill them with honey. Then they put the capping on the top and it's nice white clear capping, it's new foundation. It's lovely and clean and edible. On the cells that are not capped, this honey is not ripe and it would be wrong to take this honey out of a hive, extract it and prepare it for sale because the moisture content is wrong and the honey would not be um, nice to eat. It needs to be fully ripened with the wax capping on top of all the cells before you extract it. Now, pollinators and the whole idea of this talk is for pollen. And when bees visit flowers, the hair, hairs on the little body get covered in pollen grains from the plants and the flowers. So they groom themselves and they put it into their little back legs, the pollen baskets, and they bring it in. This shot shows that the bees have been working two different types of flowers. One is yellow pollen and the other is a white pollen. So what is pollen? Pollen is collected from plants. It sticks to the bees' hairs as a collect nectar. It's used as protein to feed the young bees in the hive and the bees themselves digest it and produce bee milk. And the bee milk then is used to feed the young bees and the larvae. It comes from the anthers of the flowers. Flowers are fertilized when pollen contacts the receptor stigma of another flower of the same species. The color and the nectar attracts the pollinator into the flower to get it pollinated. There is also a beautiful scent of these flowers. All plants need to be pollinated, yet very few plants self-pollinate with the vast majority depending on animals, insects, wind or water to pollinate the plant. Here we see the honeybees and they're hogging the limelight. In other words, there is a colony of bees nearby and all the bees are working the flowers that are in the locality of the hive. Therefore, they're letting no room for any of the natural, normal insects and pollinators that we all like to see. These include wasps, um, hoverflies, ladybirds, butterflies, and numerous other ones. I'll go into a little bit more detail in a second. So besides the bees, here we see our selection of insects on the screen. And we have um, beetles, moths, wasps, solitary wasps, bumblebees, uh, butterflies, uh, different solitary bees and honeybees. Now around the world, we have birds who hover and take nectar out of plants. And the same story, the pollen gets onto the feathers and stuff, rodents passing over stuff on the ground, reptiles, squirrels passing through the trees, monkeys, and even, as far as I know, in China, people actually hand pollinate. 
Now I've seen something in England where rhododendrons were playing were self pollinated for to breed different varieties, and it was very interesting just to see how one particular gentleman retired from the RAF has been the last thirty years uh, pollinating rhododendrons to give different varieties. In Europe, most of our pollinators are butterflies, beetles, bees, hoverflies, moths, and wasps. Now, moths are an interesting one. We'll cover it later. Wild insects are the most important and most vulnerable pollinators that we need to look out for. As a beekeeper, I look out all my bee, my bee colonies and make sure they're kept safe and kept well and kept healthy. And therefore, I am looking after the honeybees. But the question is, who looks after the insects, hoverflies, and other pollinators that are so vital to the environment? Here we see where pollinators work together. We have a bumblebee, one of our solitary bumblebees, and another one of our hoverflies, and they both work in the same plant. Again, here we have a beautiful butterfly working a beautiful flower with a array, an array of colors that are magnificent. And here we have honeybees working the same flower. So we can all work together. Now, I said you about noc moths. Moths are nocturnal pollinators and they're pollinated by night. Here you can see a moth sucking some nectar out of a flower and therefore he collects in pollen and as he moves on to the next flower, he'll pollinate the next flower with the pollen from this flower. So the pollinators again, the pollen grains is taken onto the bee. A bee flies to the next flower and plant and the pollen grains attach to the stigma, which in turn uh, fertilize the flower and produce the seed and the fruit. Um, like in apples now, it, it produces the seed inside the apple, but it's actually the apple, the fruit around the apple in the ovary is what we eat. That's good. So wind pollinators are mostly grasses and stuff like that. So the pollen grains are very light, small and light, they occur in very large numbers. The antlers are exposed to the wind so that the pollen can easily blow them away. And the stigma are feathery to catch the pollen carried in the wind. The petals are small and green as there is no need to attract insects as it's done by wind. So there is no scent or nectar in grasses. Then there are wind pollinated flowers on the grass. So, the big question everybody asks me as a beekeeper is how to get bees in my garden. So how do you get bees in your garden? Well, the first thing I'm going to say to you is you don't need a honeybee hive or a colony bees down into your garden. As a person asked me yesterday, could they put a colony between the greenhouse and the hen house and their garden? And I advise strongly against it because the children going down collecting the eggs would get stung by the bees because you'd be walking across the flight path of the bees and you'd be putting yourself in danger. So if you want bees in your garden, there's very simple things for you to do. Grow your garden a little bit on the wild side. Now, not all your garden, just a little few corners, outer side corners, stuff like that. You can grow plants for all the seasons of the year. Avoid using garden chemicals, sprays, and neonicotinoids. Also, when you're choosing single flower plants, choose plants that haven't been treated with neonicotins to prevent insects from pollinating the plants. They're basically treated in the garden centers and in the grow centers um, with chemicals that last the life of the plant, and therefore it affects any insect that comes in contact with it. Grow some trees and shrubs, but be aware of trees and the size of your garden and the size of the trees you select. Uh, plant a butterfly bush. Budilia is a beautiful bush. And when you see it covered in butterflies, uh, it is a, a sight to behold. I had one last year and I counted over 42 butterflies hovering around the plant and pollinating it. It was absolutely magical to see it. Provide plenty of different habitats around your garden for the bees and for the insects and for the pollinators. And choose several colors of flowers. 
have an array of color in your garden. It'll be pleasing for yourself, and it's also pleasing for the insects that come to pollinate it. Choose several colors of flowers, sorry. Plant the flowers and anting your plant in the sunny spots which shelter from the wind that they won't get blown over and damaged and there'll be no nectar in it. So, from February to March, you can plant in your garden some snowdrops, daffodils, crocuses, gorse, hazel, and willow. Now, willow is a tree and hazel is a tree, so you need a larger garden. So consult again with your garden center or wherever you're purchasing your plants for your garden and get advice on how big things will grow and how tall things will grow. And just be aware of encroaching over the wall into your neighbor's garden and stuff when the, when the tree or shrub grows higher. In April and May, black thorn, dandelions, cordons like black cordon, red cordon, gooseberry, I see the rape, laurel, sycamore, hostchickness, hawthorn, and holly are all excellent sources of pollen and nectar for our pollinating insects. I see rape is a commercial crop grown by farmers and it is very specialized. So you wouldn't really be planting that in your garden. But these are just a sample of what you can grow to help our pollinators survive. June and August, white clover, blackberry, field beans, raspberry, lime, and willow hep are all fabulous um, flowers to attract insects, pollinators, and other wildlife into our gardens. Again, the lime tree, a huge tree. Uh, so again, plenty of advice, is your garden suitable for a tree as big as this tree? The honey that comes from the lime tree is absolutely beautiful. It's very hard to actually get it because it really needs real prime conditions for the lime tree to harvest a good crop of honey for the beekeepers. But at any time, it will always produce for pollinating insects. And in September, October, we're heading now, lads, into the winter, preparing for the winter. So our insects are preparing to hibernate. So they need to increase their body size and their body fat uh, to survive a long cold winter. As you can see, we have to cover November, December and January. So the plants here are headers, even in primroses and ivy. Ivy is a fabulous source of uh, pollen and nectar for insects heading into the winter. It can be easily grown against the side of a wall in your garden with a few steel nails and let it climb up the wall and cling on. And you can keep it chopped and cut, but you're better off and leave it grow wild so that the flowers will produce. If you chop it and you cut it back, it'll take two years for it to produce flowers again. So I'd like to thank you all very much for taking the time out to listen to me this morning. I finish on a yellow rose. And a red rose is for true love. And of course, there's a honeybee in the middle of it. I'd like again to thank the, all the people that have assisted me in making the video. And I would like to thank all the staff of Cork County Library and the Grow, for, Grow Forward initiative that's, that's been offered at the moment through the Cork County Library Service. I'd like to thank you all again and talk to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.